Talking all things LSU baseball, SEC as well with our good friend Mikey Matuk. You might recall an LSU Tiger superstar. He is also the co-host of the podcast Miked Up, a weekly live sports show and podcast with Mikey Matuk. And of course, Jared Mitchell, who played for LSU, you might recall. Mikey, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. And I told you this off air. It was a pleasure to watch you play. Pleasure to have you on the show, my man. What's going on? Oh, man, it's good to be here. I appreciate you saying that. I miss playing. I wish I was still doing it, but I'm glad that people uh, – makes me feel a little older. You know, I say, oh, I grew up watching you play, and now they're, you know, out of college, and I feel a little bit old doing that. It doesn't feel like it's that long ago, but uh, I'm glad that I'm still kind of involved in it and, and be able to talk college baseball. And I'll say this, Mikey, one of the reasons I remember watching you and Jared Mitchell play so vividly – so I was a college baseball player myself, not at the SEC level. I was just a D2 guy. Uh, but I remember going to a South Carolina game. I think it was 2009. Yep, and I, remember South seeing, Carolina. I remember, yeah, at South Carolina. And I remember seeing Jared Mitchell specifically in the box and thinking to myself, this guy's playing a different game. That is a yeah. monster in the box swinging the stick. So, again, remember watching you guys go to, go to battle with South Carolina, go to battle in Omaha, what have you, was a lot of fun. Uh, so, again, it's great to have you. Uh, I see all the jerseys on the back wall. Let me ask you this. Favorite memories as a player, both at LSU and in your professional career? Maybe if they're the same memory, you can talk about it, but I'm sure you have different memories and, and fond memories of playing the game. Favorite yeah. memory at LSU, favorite memory in the pro game? Man, that, that's a tough one. There's a lot from LSU, obviously. Um, you know, in 2009, as a freshman, uh, we won the World Series. We won the national championship. So, you know, that in itself was – you know, that's that's going to be a, 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 one of my favorite memories of all time, right? You win the World Series, you get there as a freshman, I get an opportunity to be a starter. Um, so that whole experience, and then my last home game at LSU in 2011, I was a junior, but I think everybody had kind of figured out I was probably going to leave, and we were playing Tennessee at home, and and uh, my last at-bat was, was a home run. And when I went back out there for um, the top half of the ninth, you know, Coach Maneri treated me as a senior. So he let me go out there and then he brought me, he actually Spencer Ware of all people, a football player was on the baseball team at the time. And he came out and got me before the inning started. So I kind of got, I got a standing ovation. I thought that was a really cool thing. I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. And so very uh, fortunate that, you know, Coach Maneri was able to let me have that experience. And, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of a lasting memory for me. And then as far as pro ball, um, and there's, there's a, there's a lot, you know, my, my debut was, was memorable. My first hit in the big leagues was a home run when I was in Toronto. And, um, you know, so th those are pretty memorable. And then when I was in Detroit, I had a lot of really, really cool memories in 17, I was able to, you know, I was an everyday player and I got to play with Miggy, Miggy and JD Martinez and Ian Kinsler and Justin Upton and Burlander and all those guys. And so, you know, to pinpoint one of those specific memories, uh, would be too hard, but I'd, I'd probably say, um, you know, my my my, you know, first hit being a homer was, was pretty uh, special. Greatest baseball player you've been around, Mikey. You mentioned some of those pro guys. Who's the best baseball player you've ever seen? Man, now are you talking about teammates? Or are you talking about guys I played against? Just overall, just like the the best player, you're like that's the greatest baseball player I've ever seen. I I figured you were gonna say Miguel Cabrera, honestly, because I I've heard that that he's just yeah. So Miggy, I got to play with Miggy when he was at the back end of his career, right? I love Miggy, and we 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 got to be pretty close when I played with him, and I was in his his, his you know BP group, and so I got to see him do some special things, and obviously, you know, one of the top players of all time. Um, but playing against Mike Trout. You know, I think people kind of get numb to how good he actually is, right? Because, you know, he's been hurt in the last couple of years, but every year he does the same thing, and that same thing is elite, right? And being able to watch him up close and see how big he really is in person and be able to move the way he moves, um, that was pretty – you know, he, he was a pretty special player. And then I got to play with Bryce Harper uh, in 2020 in, um, in Philly, and – I think people kind of uh, underestimate how really how good he really is and how hard he plays. And so um, being around those guys, I got to play with Verlander and the way he approaches the game is um, is pretty special. And so, look, I'm cheating. I'm telling you a whole bunch of different guys, but I don't think I can go wrong with any one of those three. Mikey, when you look at the college game now compared to when you played, 
Yep. How crazy is it to look at it? Because I, I recall the early 2010s, right? If a guy was bumping 95, like that was like you really yeah. took notice, right? And I, I recall some of the best Friday night starters at that time. I mean, they were low 90s, 90 to 92. You might see again a 93, 94. Now it's everybody's throwing 95 plus. Like it's it's normal to see guys throwing 97, 98. Paul Skeens last year throwing 100 on Fridays for LSU. Like, how crazy is the velocity that you're seeing at the college game right now? Yeah, it's it's pretty nuts. And I think it's that's it's from top to bottom, right? Big leagues, obviously, velos are up. College velos are up. Even in high school, velos are up, right? Technology, um, understanding how to create that velo and how to train for that. I think that's helped a lot. Back in the, and I say back in the day, it was only, you know, 10, 13, 12, 13 years ago when I was playing at LSU, you had, you kind of understood what you needed to do to throw to have a higher velocity, but you didn't have, the science wasn't behind it. You didn't have all these pitching labs that they have now. And so you had these guys that just kind of had to do it on their own. And you had guys that threw really hard. Like, don't get me wrong. I faced, you know, in college, you know, we faced guys, Sam Dyson was throwing 98, you know, when he was at South Carolina, we faced, you know, Pomerantz was throwing 97 from the left side. So we faced some guys that were doing it. Alex Meyer throwing 100 at Kentucky. And, you know, I guess we actually talked about this the other day, me and Jared. And like, when we were coming out of LSU, coming out of college, we compared SEC baseball to high A, right? You had your Friday night guy was throwing – you know, high velocity, he was probably going to be drafted in the top three rounds, more, more than likely, for the most part. Your Saturday guy kind of fell into that same t- type of category. And then your Sunday guy was solid, but not very many teams, unless you're Vandy at the time, had three guys that were probably going to get drafted first, second, third round in the rotation. And you probably had one or two guys out of the bullpen that come out and had elite stuff, and you can go. But then after that, it would kind of fall off. And so that's kind of where the high A came into play because – you know, you're getting a pro ball and the difference between college baseball, high level college baseball in the SEC and professional baseball is the depth that you have on the mound. Right. And so you have these starters that are throwing hard. Then you have these guys out the bullpen, everybody out the bullpen now throws hard. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's what you got in pro ball. Now you go look at SEC baseball. I compare it to double A baseball. Because now, I mean, you can look at LSU and I'm, I'm talking LSU cause I'm here in Baton Rouge, but you know, Arkansas has got it too. But you look at LSU and you get all the guys coming out of the bullpen. You have 10 to 12 guys on this team throwing 95 plus out of the bullpen, right? And that to me is outrageous, right? And I'm, and that's not just at LSU. That's other schools that have that as well. And so I think that's a product of the environment. That's a product of what baseball is now. Um, and I think that I think it's only going to help college baseball. And you're going to see a lot more of these guys that are extremely talented out of high school come to college more so than they used to in the past, because now you get to go to the sec and you're playing against top tier competition. You get to enjoy your college life. You get to be around these guys. You get to be around a winning culture, right? In college, it's all about winning professional baseball. It's all about development. And so I think you're going to develop a little bit more now in college. And then when you get drafted, if you do what you need to do in college, you're going to get drafted. You're going to be where you need to be. And you're going to get pushed up the minor league system a lot quicker because that's just the way baseball is now. And what's crazy to think about, Mikey, is we're sitting here talking about velocities and how good the pitchers are. And I always tell people it's, you know, it's scary that guys can pump 100 consistently. What's scarier, though, is there's guys that can hit it. I mean, the offenses, were, the offenses are incredible. What have you seen? And I know we're, we're talking broad SEC. I promise yeah. we're going to zero in on LSU in a second. Good. But what have you seen across the league? Because, I mean – the debate of who has the best lineup is a really fun one because we're talking some of the best lineups in college baseball from Jack Caglione led Florida to Jace Lavalette led Texas A&M to Ethan Petrie led South Carolina to Charlie Condon led Georgia. Like the list just goes on and on. And so it's like as good as the pitching is in college baseball, it's astounding to see just how good the hitting is. Yeah, absolutely, man. Obviously pitching is always going to be ahead of hitting, right? That's just baseball, right? Hitting is harder to do it on a consistent basis. Um, But the more times you see 100, the more times you see guys throwing 97, 98, the more more, the easier it's going to be for you to hit it, right? And if you throw a fastball, right, that's why people now say, okay, 
fastballs get hit, you're going to have to be able to move it. You're going to have to be able to locate it. You have to be able to locate off-speed pitches. I think that's becoming more important, right? So the velocity's up. Hitters are adjusting to that. They're understanding, okay, this is how we're going to have to attack it. And they're doing this at a younger age, right? So by the time they get to college, it kind of feels a little bit better. And you just named all those guys. Um, don't forget about the, the, the kid who transferred from Alabama who's at Florida as well. I think it's Shelton. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, of course, by the way, of course, Tommy Tanks at LSU. I can't. Yeah, obviously, obviously, right? (laughs) Tommy Tanks, you have all these guys. And so you have these elite players offensively that are raising the bar and raising their game to level up to these guys throwing 100, 102 miles an hour. Um, And I think that, like I said, I think that is really good for college baseball. I think it's really good for baseball as a whole. And you're seeing these guys now, after they get drafted, not – sit in the minor leagues for three, four, five years like they used to in the past. You're getting guys get up there to the big leagues in a year, two years. And, um, you know, I think that's really good for baseball. I think it's really good for major league baseball. I think it's good for college baseball. And it's just impressive. It's it's a it's a credit to these guys um, for putting in the work because this doesn't just happen overnight. I mean, you got to go out there and you got to put in the work. You got to understand what you're trying to do at the plate. You got to understand what the pitcher's trying to do. And you got to be okay with failing because – to be able to get to that point, you're going to go through some failures. And so it's a credit to those guys. Mikey, we mentioned the name Paul Skeens earlier. I'll ask you this. Have you ever seen a more dominant pitcher at the collegiate level than what we saw from Paul Skeens last year? Man, I, honestly, no. I mean, you know, people compared him to Strasburg when Strasburg was in college. The people compared him to Garrett Cole when Garrett Cole was in college. And I understand all of that. But what Paul Skeens did specifically his last year, I don't think that we have seen that in a really long time. Now, if you want to give the nod to Strasburg and you want to give the nod to Garrett Cole because they did it over a three-year stretch, I can I can understand that. But as far as what you saw from, from Paul his last year and the way he understood how to pitch right he wasn't just throwing 102 mile an hour fastballs and getting everybody out with his heater he was he has a nasty change up he was able to to locate his breaking ball he was he was able to change up his fastball right one of my favorite outings of his year of the year last year was in the sec tournament and it wasn't his best outing but one of my favorite to watch him was when he played arkansas in the sec tournament and you could on you could see what arkansas's approach was against him right we're going to attack the fastball. We're going to be aggressive. We're not going to let them get ahead of us. And they're putting on some pretty good swings. They're putting off some pretty good swings on his on his fastball. And you saw him flip the switch, say, all right, this is what you're going to do. I'm going to start throwing my 98-mile-hour two-seamer in on your hands, and I'm going to get you off of that, and I'm going to start pitching. And to me, that showed the maturity that he had on the mound, the ability to do it. Because it's one thing to say, hey, this is what I need to do. It's another thing – to execute it. And he's able to execute it. He's able to understand, Hey, sometimes I got to change the way I'm trying to attack these guys. And that's what separates him from some of the other elite pitchers um, in college baseball. So Mikey, the question turns to with this year's LSU team, how do you replace Paul Skeens? Thatcher heard last couple starts has been so, so right. Not great. And and I don't think we're going to get another Paul Skeens, right? Again, generational talent. When right. you look at this LSU pitching staff, and you look at this LSU team, because offensively, you got Tommy Tanks back. I think if you're holding a Golden Spikes ticket for him, that's like a golden ticket because I think he's going to be one of the favorites, certainly going to be right there in contention at season's end. You've got Bear Jones. You've got Hayden Dravinsky. You picked up Michael Braswell from South Carolina. The list goes on and on. I think there's enough swing in the stick there in Baton Rouge. Is there enough on the mound in your mind? And, of course, the question that really I think we were all asking before the season started you lose Paul Skeens, you lose Dylan Cruz. In your opinion, Mikey, do they have enough to replace that to go back to back? So I don't. I think. I think the question is, how, it's not how do you replace Paul Skeens because that's he's irreplaceable, right? You're not going to have somebody to go and take over that same role. Um, I think it's how do you manage this staff and this rotation this year compared to last year when you don't have Paul, right? And Paul is a generational guy. You're not going to have to – not, you can't worry about replacing him. But what you do have at LSU is you have four or five guys that you can put in that rotation that's going to be able to give you six, seven innings, right? You have a deeper pitching staff, I believe, this year. They have a deeper bullpen. Now, last year they had a bunch of injuries early in the season, 
right? I know people kind of forget about that, but you have Grant Taylor who got drafted in the supplemental round, didn't even get to pitch. Chase Shores got hurt in the first few weeks of the season. He was a six foot nine guy throwing a hundred as a freshman. He wasn't able to throw for the rest of the year. You had uh, Jaden Newt who got who had Tommy John before the season even started. He was supposed to factor in to the rotation. So you have all these high level guys that got hurt. And so I think it took away from their depth last year. This year, I think even if you lost a couple guys, you have that depth, right? You have high velocity righties. You have, I think they have 10 lefties in there on their pitching staff that Jay is comfortable throwing in in any situation. You bring in a Juco guy, uh, Fidel Uyoa, who has been up to this point out early in the season, one of Jay's favorite guys to come out of the bullpen in critical situations. And he's throwing mid nineties and he has location. He throws strikes. And so I think that what you miss in Paul Skeens last year, you're making up for in depth and, and quality arms. Right. So I'm, I'm not so much worried about the pitching staff. You talked about Thatcher. Uh, yeah. Thatcher didn't get off to a great start. He didn't get off to a great start last year, but what's encouraging for me is Thatcher's not walking a lot of guys, right? Guys are hitting him. I'm okay with that. I think that he's going to kind of round into form and he's going to start getting the swings and misses to me, that means he's just – he's throwing strikes, but he's not throwing necessarily the most high-quality strikes because he's getting hard contact hard contact off of him. And so I think that's going to change. Uh, Luke Holman, transfer from Alabama, has been electric. Mm-hmm. His, his, his first two starts have been as good as you want um, in a Saturday guy. So you may see him move up. You have Gage Jump coming out of the bullpen right now. They're Now they're trying to – they're easing him back into the starting role. He's 95, 97 from the left side, transfer from UCLA. And then you have a couple freshmen, you know, that are coming in here that are that are trying to make a a name for themselves. Um, that they're starting to throw the ball really well. Kate Anderson is a is a lefty throwing, you know, mid nineties freshman from Louisiana. So I think their depth on the mound is their strength. Um, and then flipping to the offensive side, man, you, you mentioned Dylan Cruz. Let's not forget about the other four guys that left. Dylan Cruz is gone. You have Jaden J- Braden Joe Bear is gone. Cade Beloso has gone. Trey Morgan's gone. Uh, uh, Thompson's gone. So you have all these guys that are veterans that put up a lot of uh, production last year. This offense is a little bit different. You do have Tommy coming back. You have Trevinci back. You have Bear Jones, who seems like he's made some nice adjustments in his swing back. He's already got four home runs this year. And now you have to replace those other guys with some of these newcomers and guys that have been there. Paxton Kling's looked really good, right? I think this offense is going to take a little time to kind of get some experience and kind of feel their, get their footing. I believe this offense is going to be really good. Is it going to look like last year? No. If it does, awesome. But I don't, you're not going to hit the amount. I think they hit 140 home runs last year or something as a team. I don't see that happening this year. I think they're going to be able to score a bunch of runs. It's just going to be happening in, in, um, in some different ways. And, you know, to answer your final question, do I think they have what it takes? and the talent and the squad to go and make a deep run, I do. Really hard to repeat as national champions. Um, you know, you have a target on your back, and it, it's just, it's hard to do that two years in a row. I do believe they have a shot. I do believe they can make a deep run. Um, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to predict, oh, they're going to win the national championship, but I uh, would not be shocked if you saw them in Omaha making a run again. Mikey, I'm sure you've talked about this because obviously you've been in this exact position when you guys won the national title in 2009. What would be your greatest piece of advice or, or you know, what you recall that the toughest thing about going back to back or or the thing that, you know, maybe you've spoken on this that you would tell Jay Johnson and the LSU baseball team about, hey, this is the thing that, you know, you guys will have to overcome or have to tackle or keep this in mind. And it's going to make your life much easier because, again, you've pursued that and you know firsthand how difficult it is to go back to back. Yeah, look, we won it in 2009 when I was a freshman. 2010, Anthony Renato was coming back, projected top five pick in the draft. Our our Saturday guy ended up being a third rounder um, in Austin Ross. We had Matty Ott, who's a freshman All-American, who was our closer. He was coming back. We had a bunch of guys in the lineup coming back. Now, we lost a bunch, but we had a bunch coming back. Uh, we were 32-6, and six, ranked number one in the country, 11-4 in conference feeling really good. We lost seven straight. We got swept at Ole Miss, basically got walked off three straight times, lost our midweek, and then got, you know, our doors blown off against Florida at Florida. And so we lost seven straight, and we had to figure it out. We had some injuries, and we ended up 
you know, making, got getting better towards the end of the year, had to fight to make the tournament, ended up winning the SC tournament and we're a two seed in the UCLA regional. And I think this team right now was built up a little bit better than we were in that 2010 season. I think they have more depth than we did. Um, I think they have the ability to fill some, fill some holes if, if they, they, you know, incur some injuries, you know, I think they are better equipped for that. And getting to, you know, talk to Jay about this, you know, he's doing the right things, the way he's speaking about it. Every year, my advice would be every year, no matter if you return 95% of your team, it's a different team, right? The, the, the chemistry is different. The way you go about things are different. Your goals are different. And so Jay has hammered that home from day one this season. I think you have a lot of young guys that really understand they need to make their, their way and make their mark. And I think they have this motivation moving forward. Um, and so I think Jay's saying all the right things. I think the guys are doing all the right things. They're ta- they're telling me all the right things. Um, and, and you know, watching him play, it seems like, you know, they're not taking anything for granted. They're not assuming, oh, we're the national champs. We're just going to go out there and people are going to lay down for us. Now it's going to be the other way, right? We're the national champs. People are going to play harder. Stony Brook, you know, beat them last week. They're seven and one. Good start to the season. Uh, you don't, you're not going to go 56, you know, nobody's ever done that. Right. And so I think that they understand the challenges that they have. And uh, it's the SEC, man. I mean, you can't let down for one game and just expect this thing just to work out the way you want it to work out unless you kind of got forced it to happen. So I think that, you know, they have the right mindset and I'm looking forward to see how it, how it shakes out during the year. Mikey, you mentioned LSU 7-1 and one early on this season. And, again, it's very, very early baseball, a marathon, not a sprint, as we know. So, overreacting at this point in the year right. uh, would not make a lot of sense. But Fans don't, they, fans don't understand that. Fans right. don't understand. <laughs> Everywhere. Right. Everywhere. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure LSU fans took that Stony Brook loss with a, uh, in an even keel manner, if you will. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. But when you look at this team early, I mean, your, your biggest takeaway, has there been anything that surprised you, anything that – has worked out better than you expected, worse than you expected. Again, it's very, yeah. very early, and we're going to learn a lot more this weekend. I want to talk to you in a second about the Astros Foundation Classic and the matchups for LSU because that's going to be a lot of fun to get a, a real gauge on what this team is. Yeah. But just early thoughts in this ball club and what you've seen to this point. Yeah, I think coming in, you had expectations of certain guys that either, you know, known commodities, right? Guys that were here for a couple years that you kind of knew what you got from them and what to expect from them. Um, and that's what you kind of go into the season expecting. And then every year something changes, right? Fidel Uyo, I hadn't even heard about him. I didn't even know who this guy was. He was a JUCO transfer. He comes out in, in the first two weekends. He's been one of the first guys out of the bullpen in crucial situations. That's a huge surprise, you know, for me. Um, you bring in some of these freshmen, right? Milam comes in. He's a switch hitting middle infielder. You don't really hear much about him, you know, up up until about two weeks into leading into the season. He has been in the, he's been playing, you know, every, almost every game, it seems like, and he's doing something, whether it's a defensive play, whether it's getting on base, whether it's, it is, you know, coming up with a big hit, you're seeing those types of those, those types of guys step up. And I think that is the most important thing, right? You want some of these guys that you don't hear about to start making their name and start forcing their way into the lineup, right? And I think the other thing is Jay is not afraid to change the lineup up a lot, right? You haven't seen the same starting lineup two games in a row, at least. Now, don't quote me on that. I don't know for true, for fact, but I would I would imagine you have not seen the same starting lineup for two straight games. And so I think that's been the most surprising thing to me, pleasantly surprised. And then you have a... Um, you know, you have some guys that have been there for multiple years already that you kind of understood, oh, this is what this guy has. And those guys have, have increased at a level. Sam Dutton, right? That's a name people probably hear of. He's This is his third year at LSU. His two years ago in Jay's first year, he was a guy through strikes, low 90s. Last year, same type of thing. Wasn't really counted on much out of the bullpen. This year, he's coming in. He's 95-97 still throwing strikes, and he is a guy that seems like Jay is building more confidence with and gaining more confidence, and you're going to see him a lot more. So I think those are a lot of the the, the surprises that I'm pleasantly um, surprised about. And, Mikey, as I mentioned, this weekend we're going to learn a lot about this LSU ball club. The Astros Foundation Classic LSU on Friday night will take on 
the Texas Longhorns at Minute Maid Park, certainly one of the favorites to get to Omaha. You then got on Saturday, Louisiana Lafayette, the Raging Cajuns, which, of course, that's always a fun game. And then finally on Sunday, you take on Texas State, which they've been really good the last couple of years. It's a really good program they've got down there. Um, I'll ask you this. Your thoughts on these these collegiate baseball tournaments, I don't know that we had these 10 years ago. It's been a lot of fun to watch these at Globe Life and in Houston. And, yep. you know, we had Jacksonville last weekend. We had Round Rock, many others. Your thoughts on the tournament play and then what you're excited to see from LSU this week. And, I mean, again, you got some great matchups. Of course, it's headlined by that Friday night game against the Texas Longhorns. Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. You know, I think it gives uh, – it kind of breaks up the non-conference, right? Usually in non-conference, you don't play a ton of tough – series or you don't have a lot of guys coming a lot of teams you got some teams from up north maybe coming down south they hadn't really been outside much and you're really trying to kind of get a feel for your team early on and you know i think the third week of the season is a perfect time for it now you go to a tournament you're playing three separate three different teams on three different days it kind of gives this little you know jolt of energy getting ready for the long conference schedule and so i i love it you know, last year LSU got to, had to play Texas in the same type in the same tournament. And if you don't, if you remember, uh, Thompson hits the walk off homer against Texas, right? Like these are oppor these are opportunities for you to create some momentum moving into the season, moving into conference play. Um, you're playing teams that you're probably not going to play until you get to the postseason. So I, I love it. Um, you know, I think a different angle to look at this is LSU's had three. This will be the third weekend of the season, right? This will be the third – the first two weekends were four-game series, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, which is kind of uh, unusual, right? You also hadn't played a true series against a team for three games, right? LSU's first two series were against two separate teams. So they played a game against one team, a game against another team, and you repeated that for the next two games. So you didn't have that whole, all right, we're going to play a team three days in a row and kind of get used to their bullpen. You're going to get that again this weekend, right? LSU's going – they're already in Houston. They play Rice on Wednesday. Then they got Texas on Friday, UL Lafayette, which obviously UL always wants to beat LSU, you know, an hour away from LSU. They feel like they're the little brothers of LSU. They're always looking to try to, to make some noise. You play them Saturday, and you got Texas State, and any Texas team is going to be able to find talent and have some guys be able to play. And so – you have three separate teams again. You don't have to, you don't have you don't have to get you're not going to get to the third starter on those teams more than likely. And so I think it's a unique challenge. I think it's really good for LSU. I think it's really good for teams in general to be able to put themselves in these situations. I'm looking forward um, to watch. I believe the Friday game against Texas on MLB Network. So uh, I think it's tape delayed, but I'm I'm looking forward to watching it. Mike, you on a funny side note, you mentioned the non-conference series and some of the midweeks, and I ask you this because we've had some debate uh, <laughs> off air, on air, whatever about you know. I, and I think I think those that casually follow follow college baseball will ask the question like, do midweeks really matter? Does the non-conference really matter? It does. It does matter. But I'll ask you as a former player, how tough was it at times to get up on those Tuesday nights? Because I, I just I know like you can see it. You can see it at times where it's like. It's just like it's like going through an inner squad, man. It's just like, yep. man, like, and those are where you really find out, like, the leadership and and the depth and you know the teams that can get up for those games. But I, I know it's it's a difficult task at times. Yeah, it's it's tough, right? And like, they do matter. Every game that you play matters. That's not coach speak. You do you want you don't want to look up at the end of the season and say, oh, we've lost, you know, seventeen games, but four of them were games just that we just kind of checked out, right? You don't want to look back at that. That kills the RPI. It's not good for you. And, yeah, they matter. They are also very hard to <laughs> get motivated mo motivated for game in and game out, right? Sometimes you play in a midweek, you're going to have, you know, LSU, you may have four or 5,000, which seems like a lot, but not compared to the 12,000. It's going to be a 630 game, and there may be, you know, not a ton of energy and, you know, you may be coming off a big series over the weekend. You're like, oh, well, we got um, we got you know, Vanderbilt this weekend. But we got to play Nickel State on a Wednesday. Well, you still got to go out there and you still got to win those games. And I think that's, you know, teams that are able to do that, it shows the maturity of the team. Like you said, it shows the leadership of the team. It shows that, okay, they have their mind the right. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to win every game. But you want them to go out there and put forth the effort. They say, okay, we're going to play hard. And we're going to do the things we need to do. More likely than not, they're going to win majority of those games. And so uh, if they do lose one of them, though, 
it's not the end of the world. It's not panic and say, oh, they, you know, midweek games. It's, look, when 2009, we lost to Nickel State, we lost to UL. I think we lost to Northwestern State all in midweek. Like, it happens. It's going to happen. You've seen it already happen this season. Um, they matter, but let's not put too much stock into it if if uh, one of your teams that's ranked highly that's supposed to win these games maybe loses a couple. And, Mikey, you mentioned SEC play and, and just the difficulties of it. Obviously, we know the depth of this conference, how great it is. LSU, no exception, because this is a gauntlet opening up. Uh, Mississippi State, I don't think they're very good, but you got to go to Duty Noble, which is never easy. Then you got the Florida Gators opening up home SEC play at Alex Box Stadium. At Arkansas will be really tough. Vanderbilt coming to Alex Box. Then you got to go at Tennessee to check out Tony Vitello and his club. So, I mean, everybody's got a tough schedule, but that is a gauntlet first couple weeks of the season. Uh, your thoughts on the rest of the SEC? I mentioned some of the top contenders there. I think Arkansas has got the best pitching staff in college baseball. Hagan Smith, Hagan Smith may be one overall pick in the draft. Yeah, I mean, he 17 strikeouts in that game. He's insane. Uh, 17 and, strikeouts? I don't know if people realize that's six innings. And if you don't know it, that there's only 18 outs that you can make in six innings, and he struck out 17 of those guys. That's pretty impressive. And then and then you got Mason Molina on Sundays, who, by the way, was Texas Tech's Friday guy. He's now on Sunday for Arkansas, which goes to show the – Insane depth. Florida, of course, with Caglione, Colby Shelton, uh, Cade Fisher headline the rotation. I think Texas A&M, Tennessee, all really dangerous. Vanderbilt, of course, don't sleep on Corbs and the, and the Vandy boys. So your thoughts on the best of the rest of the SEC? Of course, LSU is right there. Uh, but thoughts on the rest of the league and who are your top contenders? Who, who do you like the most to come out of the conference? Yeah, obviously, uh, the, as far as top contenders, I mean, I think you named them all there, right? Can't sleep on Georgia. Right. Georgia's got some ability. Alabama, they went through, you know, a lot of stuff last year. Right. They had a lot of things that happened behind the scenes uh, with their coach and the things that happened there. They're playing good baseball right now. Um, their Friday night guy is as elite as they come. And, you know, so they're, they're making noise. And then Auburn. Right. I think Auburn's the one that people aren't really talking a lot about. And from talking to my buddies that are in the in the coaching world in the SEC, you know, Auburn is extremely well coached, right? They're always in the situation where they're not really being talked about. They're kind of getting slept on. And all of a sudden you look up at the end of the year, they're ranked in the top 10 and, you know, they're pushing for this national seed and people are like, well, where'd they come from? And I think it comes from, Hey, these coaches, this coaching staff they have is really good. Gabe Gross does a really good job with their hitters there, um, they put themselves in a really good position uh, to win games. And they, they're they a tough out. They're a tough team to beat. So I think that's a team that people probably are starting to pay attention to. You mentioned Mississippi State not being very good. Ole Miss isn't very good right now, but it's still the SEC. Any game, any weekend can flip, right? You talk about the gauntlet. Last year, LSU had a gauntlet the first five weekends of the SEC. They got through that unscathed. They won all their series. Then everybody, me included, were like, oh, okay, now we get to the easy part of their schedule, right? Mm -hmm. They lose to Auburn, and they lose to uh, – forget exactly, but they lost two straight series, right? The last – I think they had four left. They lost two of the last four. And so you're like, oh, okay, well, nobody expected that to happen, and that's just the SEC, right? Mm -hmm. That's what can happen. Um, and so I think you name the, the main contenders. Arkansas is going to be uh, really hard out, right? Their pitching staff is elite. They're really good. Um, I'm very high on LSU, obviously. I'm not biased at all, but I'm very high on LSU. Tennessee is going to be good. Vitello has that team play, always playing with an edge. And, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see kind of how it all shakes out and uh, see who kind of gets through the SEC gauntlet and gets through the, um, the, the you know, the battle of, of just kind of beating each other up. Really quickly, Mikey, last thing, and we'll get you out of here. If LSU goes back-to-back, -back, what clicked in your mind? LSU goes back-to-back. -back, I think the main thing for me is to, uh, to have a lineup that you're confident with, right? Like, I think that they need to – and they're not. you're not going to find a lineup yet. I don't think you're going to have a, a everyday lineup until – maybe midweek through the SEC. Like, there's going to be a lot of tinkering. But towards that back half and, and and getting ready for that run, you want to have your seven, eight guys that you feel like is going to be in there majority of the time, right? And I think that's probably the main key. 
And then I think having that that rotation and having roles in that pitching staff defined, right? And that's going to get defined based off of, um, you know, who comes up clutch in these situations. And I think you're starting to see it. And again, that's not going to happen until probably midway, maybe, you know, three-fourths of the way through the SEC play. But going into that stretch run, I think those are the main two things. Understand what your rotation is and what the roles are in the bullpen. And then understand, okay, these are the seven guys that we're going to have in the lineup. And then you can mix and match the other two. Mikey Matuk, he and Jared Mitchell do a great job on the Miked Up podcast. That's M-I-K apostrophe D up. Go check them out. Mikey, appreciate you taking the time, man. This is a lot of fun. I appreciate you, man. This is a great time. I'll have you on our show the next time. We'll do a home and home. Let's do it, man. There you go.